My name is Pamela Smith. I'm the director of the Center for Science and Society. I'm really pleased to welcome you to this seminar, Drinking While Pregnant, The Science and Stigma. This event has been organized by the Presidential Scholars in Society and Neuroscience Program as part of the seminars in Society and Neuroscience series. We have many attendees from all over the world today. So I want to start by providing a short overview of the Presidential Scholars Program, which is housed in the Center for Science and Society. Presidential Scholars in Society and Neuroscience um, facilitates cross-disciplinary collaborative research to, adva to advance our understanding of mind, brain, and behavior, bringing together talented early career scholars from various fields in this, um, with faculty experts in, the, in neuroscience, in uh, the humanities and arts and social sciences, the program has developed a new paradigm for original integrative research and training. The program supports early postdoctoral scholars, seed funding for cross-disciplinary research, and many seminars, conferences, and other events. The Presidential Scholars Program is managed by the Center for Science and Society, itself a hub for researchers, scholars, and practitioners seeking to break down traditional disciplinary silos and to enhance public understanding of science and society. The core of our program is the early career scholars, postdoctoral scholars pursuing independent research about mind, brain, and behavior at the intersection of the humanities, natural, and social sciences. Each scholar receives tailored support for their project from at least two faculty mentors from different departments who have relevant knowledge and expertise to help guide their research. Current mentors come from neuroscience, sociology, psychology, psychiatry, narrative medicine, music, philosophy, English and comparative literature, and other disciplines. The scholars and PSSN faculty are central in organizing interdisciplinary events such as this one. Due to the pandemic, our, program, our programming this year is entirely virtual. I hope very much that you'll join us at our next event the Presidential Scholars Research Symposium on February 15th. The event will feature talks by Raphael Garati and Matthew Sachs with, respo with responses by their faculty mentors from neuroscience, psychology, music, and philosophy. And we will announce the rest of our spring schedule very soon. You can participate in the discussion today at any time by using the Q&A button located, whoops, Sorry, the Q&A button located at the bottom of your screen. Uh, the moderator will share your questions during the Q&A period, and you can upvote questions submitted by other attendees if you want to prioritize them to be um, part of the discussion. I hope that you'll also visit our website to learn more about the program, to sign up for our monthly newsletter, register for upcoming events, and access our vast video archive of previous seminars. Please also follow us on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram for the latest updates about our programming. The PSSN program would not be possible without the support of leadership at Columbia, including President Lee Bollinger and our wonderful steering committee members, Peter Berman, Michael Goldberg, Carol Mason, Valerie Purdy Greenaway, and Christopher Peacock. Faculty from across the university participate on the advisory committee, mentor our scholars, and volunteer to review applicants. Thanks to all of you who have helped make this program a, an example of interdisciplinary achievement. We also welcome new ideas for programming, research, and teaching activities. We will be providing ways to keep in touch in the chat box throughout this event. If you enjoy today's free event, consider making small donations that will be used to help us continue streaming our public events once we return that happy day to in-person seminars. And now I'd like to introduce Presidential Scholar Claire McCormick, who will moderate today's seminar and present the first talk. Dr. McCormick's research focuses on women's psychological health in pregnancy and the peripartum and how these experiences are affected by maternal stress and trauma. 
Claire received her PhD in public health from the National uh, Drug and Alcohol Research Center at the University of New South Wales, Sydney, in Sydney, Australia, where she studied alcohol use during pregnancy and infant cognitive development. I'd like to welcome Claire. Thank you so much, Pamela. Um, I actually wanted to start by firstly saying a few words on what this seminar is not intended to be about. This event is not meant to be a debate about whether any kind of alcohol or substance use in pregnancy is appropriate or to give any advice to pregnant women. Rather, the seminar today uh, is designed to trace the evidence for and the origins of warnings that are given to pregnant women and to talk about broader issues of equity, health and welfare for women and their children. Um, I also want to mention that while alcohol use is going to be a focus, in this discussion it's relevant for us and informative to include discussion of other substances of abuse as well. Um, and the Presidential Scholars Seminar is really the ideal venue to have this discussion because this conversation requires input from scholars, psychology, law, public health and many other voices. So for my part, I'll begin by briefly talking about fetal alcohol spectrum disorders. I'll also spend time focusing on epidemiological data, empirical data from human cohort studies, and then consider implications for health and research. I want to open with this drawing, Gin Lane from 1751. Um, at this time, people were warned that gin is a poisonous distillation um, and for the fetus in the womb and for the infant breastfeeding. Gin is blamed for all these problems in this group rather than their impoverished living conditions. And interestingly, this question, what must become of the infant who is conceived in gin is actually more or less the same question that was asked by researchers who first described what we now call fetal alcohol syndrome. Some background into the history of how fetal alcohol syndrome came to be. It first appeared in medical journals in the early 70s following a number of uh, small case studies. It received coverage by the media, it quickly became a public health threat and by 81 the Surgeon General in the US had issued its official warning advising uh, women who were pregnant or thinking about pregnancy to not drink alcohol. Um, and just want to point out that this is quite an unusual ideology for a developmental disorder because a substance was assumed to be dangerous to the fetus before any systematic longitudinal data was gathered. So rather than observing a syndrome in children and then looking for its cause. Uh, since those early case studies, terminology and diagnostic criteria have emerged for both fetal alcohol syndrome and also fetal alcohol spectrum disorders. Uh, it's characterized by these four features um, and fetal alcohol syndrome can actually be diagnosed even without confirmed prenatal alcohol exposure if this facial phenotype is present. Um, fetal alcohol spectrum disorders or FASD is the most commonly used term today which emerged as an umbrella term because it was recognized that uh, there was a wide range of vastly heterogeneous cognitive and behavioral features present among infants exposed to varying degrees of alcohol in utero. However, central nervous system deficits are always required, the most commonly described being in intellectual ability and externalizing behavior. Um, and it's not included in DSM, but uh, neurodevelopmental disorder with prenatal alcohol exposure is considered a condition study. So soon after the earlier studies emerged to describe FAS, there was clearly a need for experiments to determine whether alcohol actually had the potential to cross, to cross the placenta and affect the fetus. So the only way to test this is with animal studies. Essentially, animal models provide evidence that alcohol is a teratogen. So early primate studies could show that with enough alcohol exposure, up to 100% of uh, pregnancies will fail. Um, and rodent studies are still used um, to get at mechanisms so they can tell us about sensitive periods of exposure and about mechanism of actions by removing brains of those exposed. So animal models, they have allow random allocation to exposure, con exposure conditions. They've confirmed that alcohol can be a teratogen, um, but these kinds of exposure we're talking about generally don't, don't reflect real world drinking patterns or behavior. 
um, in humans, alcohol use is a complicated social behavior and definitely not randomly allocated. Um, indeed, epidemiological data clearly indicate that FAS is not an equal opportunity birth defect. The, uh, regardless of how it's measured, FASD is consistently found um, in, to be concentrated in disadvantaged populations globally. And many of these risk factors are also factors that uh, in and of themselves affect functioning in the domains most commonly affected in FASD. So where this becomes really puzzling is when you compare these factors alongside those that are actually associated with drinking in general. So on this slide, I have a, a summary of from two different systematic reviews. On the left are maternal factors found to be associated with having a child who has FASD from one systematic review, a second one uh, looking at factors associated with prenatal alcohol exposure in general. So this shows some similarities, but it shows some really striking differences in very important areas. So most significantly, education, income and employment status show the complete opposite pattern among those uh, with, who have children with FASD uh, compared to the group that's most likely to drink alcohol. So how could it be that those who are most at risk of being exposed to alcohol in pregnancy are not the same as those who are most at risk for fetal alcohol spectrum disorders? This really is an epidemiological puzzle. It's the crux of what I'm trying to answer. Um, but ultimately, we can already see that it's clearly not uh, going to be a simple case of cause and effect. So to make sense of this puzzle, to determine what harm might actually be caused by alcohol use and not other factors, we need large, well-controlled, longitudinal cohort studies. So I'm going to start with one such example from my own work done in Australia. Um, this was from a government-funded cohort study where mothers were recruited during pregnancy at antenatal clinics of three public hospitals. They completed detailed interviews about drug and alcohol use during their pregnancy. Um, and consistent with the previous slide, alcohol use was most common among older, wealthier, married and more highly educated women. Um, so briefly, I'll show data about one of the primary outcomes, which was infant cognitive development at 12 months. And that's uh, because cognitive deficits are one of the core features of FASD. Naturally, it's one of the primary outcomes of interest for cohort studies like this that are prospectively looking for effects of alcohol exposure. So interestingly, not only do we not see any negative effect of alcohol use in pregnancy on infant cognitive outcomes, we actually saw that infants born to women who drank alcohol actually perform slightly better than those uh, born to children, born to mothers who did not drink at 12 months of age. So the abstainers are shown in the red on the graph there. The different colored bars next to it represent different levels of statistical adjustment. Uh, so we tried many different statistical models because we really wanted to make sure there wasn't some actual effect of alcohol use that was being obscured by confounding factors. Um, but apparently there was not. And okay, but we wanted to be really sure of this finding, seemingly counterintuitive finding. It was not a randomized control trial. So uh, we can use propensity, something called propensity score matching, which is a statistical technique used in observational studies when there's um, disproportionate selection into either exposure or control groups um, leading to selection bias. So we can calculate a score Oops, uh, we can calculate a score uh, that reflects your likelihood of belonging to a particular group. And the sample was large enough to allow um, 337 low level drinkers to be matched to a, an, a group of women who did not drink alcohol. And so even using this really careful matching, we actually still saw that statistically significant difference where children born to drinkers had slightly higher cognitive scores than those born to abstainers. So this is not a clinically significant difference. It's about a two point difference in the equivalent of baby IQ score, but it is statistically quite robust. Um, so we weren't the only cohort study to report this. This is uh, 
a slide from a meta-analysis looking at pull, pull together the best evidence from human research in cohort studies like ours, uh, in, including two major ones, the ULSPAC study and the Millennium cohort studies in the UK. So this meta-analysis includes over 26,000 children and um, the acronyms to the right are just different kinds of measures of um, child cognitive outcomes. So again, with pooling all this data together, we, we see the same significant apparent positive effect of low level alcohol exposure on infant development. Now, we don't conclude that uh, these effects are actually uh, caused by, that, that really is a true apparent positive effect that's caused by alcohol use. But then by the same token, how sure are we that all of the previously reported negative effects were actually caused by alcohol use? Um, and I want to talk about another significant recent study published a few months ago. I think it's the largest of its kind in the US. Uh, it uses data from a large representative sample, the ABCD study of nearly 10,000 um, participants in the US using standardized assessments of cognition as well as maternal report outcomes looking at psychopathology. This study also has neuroimaging data um, and they were able to also use multiple methods to uh, control for other variables. And in this sample, just under 2% report uh, drinking at low levels after the point of pregnancy awareness. So this plot shows the outcomes from that paper that were most strongly affected by alcohol exposure. So at first glance, it looks like a uniformly negative series of childhood cognitive and psychological outcomes. And indeed, the author's conclusion from this study was that any amount of alcohol can harm children. But actually, this slide is a mixed bag. Um, I've marked here that some of these outcomes are actually in a positive direction. So we see better performance in memory, executive functioning and attention in the alcohol exposed group. Um, however, when looking at the maternal report measures like behavioral problems, attention, mood and anxiety, we see more of those being reported by mothers who also reported drinking alcohol in pregnancy. So remembering that the main symptoms of FASD are in thinking and memory, behavior problems, attention problems and intellectual ability. This, is, this data is a little confusing in comparison to what we would expect based on knowledge of fetal alcohol harms. Um, also to be clear, none of these effects would be considered clinically significant. We're not talking about any suggestion either of actual psychopathology or of particularly high cognitive ability in children born to mothers who drank alcohol at low levels. They're just small but statistically significant group differences. Now it's really illuminating to compare the findings of that Lise et al paper with results published around the same time from the exact same cohort. So this paper um, is using the ABCD cohort, but this time taking a data-driven approach using a principal component analysis of 39 environmental measures, 30 child behavior and cognitive measures to identify clusters of parental and social factors and clusters of child outcomes. In these analyses, alcohol use was not associated with any child psychopathology, uh, behavioral or cognitive outcomes. Instead, parent psychopathology showed the strongest associations with child psychopathology. Socioeconomic status had the strongest associations with cognitive outcomes. And the proximal social environment like school quality and neighborhood safety and, um, and social interactions had the strongest association with impulsive behaviors. Uh, so this slide, shows that information visually. In the top left are those maternal report, child behavior and psychological outcomes from the Lees et al study that were shown to be positively associated with low level alcohol use. So while you can faintly see that correlation here in the pale green, I think what's very obvious uh, from this broader view is that parent psychopathology by far and away shows the strongest associations with child psychopathology. And this converges with evidence from the developmental origins of health and disease model for the transmission of maternal psychological distress to offspring, which is then perpetuated by um, exposure to less optimal caregiving and exposure to adverse postnatal environment in the context of parental stress um, and psychopathology. Uh, 
This is another way of viewing that data where you see in the on the left, the orange um, is child psychopathology for which you can see parent psychopathology has the strongest standardized regression coefficient and on the right in the green, uh, uh, general cognition is has the most has the strongest association with uh, socioeconomic status and the social environment. So, taken together, these two studies from the same cohort, the ABCD cohort, they make very clear a conceptual challenge in integrating behavioral teratology studies with studies from the developmental origins of health and disease and other research approaches. Are we interested in asking what harm might alcohol or a substance cause or what predicts poorer or enhanced development? Because clearly the framing of the research question and then the statistical analyses that we choose can lead to entirely different conclusions. So the sum of the evidence suggests that while alcohol can be, is a teratogen, it can affect the fetus, low level exposure is actually very common and does not generally lead to any clinically meaningful impairment. Um, importantly, it's clear that any observed associations may not be purely causal. Environmental factors are a huge piece of the puzzle. My two cents are that addressing mental health needs of women and partners are, is a possible solution to both alcohol use by pregnant women and also improving child psychological and cognitive outcomes if that's the main concern. Um, and that's because maternal depression, stress and anxiety are by far the biggest predictors of child emotional um, and behavioral problems as well as social determinants of health. Um, they're also among the biggest predictors of alcohol use. So access to psychological care may be the most logical target for improving health of women and the next generation, both for drinkers and non-drinkers. Um, I want to come back to this image as I finish. So in Gin Lane, we saw that those who live in Gin Lane are destroyed by their addiction to the foreign spirit of gin. But the other half of this series of, um, of works is called Beer Street. And on Beer Street, people are happy and healthy they are nourished by English ale and it depicts industry, health and commerce. So the side-by-side -side images, I think show us that the same drug can look very different when it's used by different people. And the caricature suggests a, a stigma that can be unfairly applied. So with that, I would like to now introduce the next speaker. Uh, professor Caitlin Killian is a professor of sociology at Drew University. She received her PhD in sociology with certificate in women's studies from Emory University and her BA in comparative literature with concentration in women's studies from Swarthmore College. She teaches courses on gender, families, reproduction and immigration, as well as globalization. And relevant to our discussion today, she's currently writing a book on how the cultural standards for mothers and fathers differ including criminalization of women's behavior during pregnancy. Her paper published last year called Fetal Alcohol Syndrome Warnings, Policing Women's Behavior Distort Science um, in the Journal of Applied Social Science is really essential reading on this topic. So I'll now stop sharing my screen and hand over to Professor Killian. Okay, so uh, as a sociologist, our, our bread and butter is often this idea of social construction. And so when we think about what's real, what does, what does that mean? Is something innate? Is something biological? And one way to always get at this, a quick and dirty way to get at this, is does something vary historically? Does something vary cross-culturally? And that would tell us something about whether it's socially or culturally constructed. And then there's a lot of work in sociology on the development of particular social problems where we want to ask ourselves questions like, why did this become a problem now at this particular moment in history at this particular time? What other related or larger problems are we ignoring while we focus on this problem? Who gains from attention to this particular problem? And we have to ask, is this really even a problem at all? Um, and I will digress for a moment. One of our favorite examples is about Halloween candy, which sounds like it has nothing to do with alcohol. 
but it is about poisoning children. Um, and there's policy that has been made around this at, at local levels where towns have canceled Halloween and canceled trick or treating, and it has to be done in a school or it has to be done in a firehouse out of fear of children being poisoned by their neighbors, by people on their street. This is where we go back to asking ourselves some questions. If we take a step back, homicidal maniac neighbors who don't wanna murder your children 300 and however many days a year, but only one day a year, we've all fallen for this story that we have to check our children's candy. And yet there's not a single case of a stranger poisoning candy on Halloween that's killed a child in the US. So how did this become a social problem? When we ask about the timing of it, um, in that case, we've seen fears around children. A lot of our social problems have to do with concerns about taking care of children and keeping children safe in an era where people only have one or two children. And okay. I'm sorry to interrupt. Are we supposed to see the slides? Oh, yes. I thought you could see the slide. I'm glad you let me know, Joseph, because... I could see the slide and didn't realize that you could not. I had screen shared. Let me try again. I'll pull it up again. Okay, excellent. Thank you for stopping me. Um, so I was talking about this culturally accepted idea that parents need to check their children's Halloween candy. And yet there's zero evidence that this is actually a threat to children. But it arose in a context where we are increasingly concerned about the safety of our children. And also where we had a lot of urban legends around contaminated food and contaminated food products. So all kinds of urban legends around um, fingers in the chili at Wendy's and a mouse in a Coke bottle and pop rocks exploding in people's stomachs. And so we put together urban legends and narratives around contaminated food with fear of children and it resonated culturally. And that's the point, something that I want us to keep in mind is why would something that if we take a step back and ask some questions about might not make sense, why, why would people gravitate to that? Or why would people be quick to believe it without wanting to see evidence about it? So thinking about this historically and cross-culturally, um, Certainly we know in other countries that drinking patterns have differed from the United States. And also that historically in many places in the world, it was safer to drink beer and ale and wine than to drink local water that gave you cholera and other things. And that meant that children were drinking alcohol. That meant that pregnant women were drinking alcohol. I provided a quote here from the 15th century and what became Italy about noble women being encouraged to consume dry red wine, not only so that they would have a healthy baby, but so that they would have a boy, um, which admittedly is not very scientific, but this is the, the advice that women were being given. And I myself received similar advice about how to have a healthy baby from my French mother-in-law about 20 years ago. My son's 19 now. I went to France to visit her in Paris and she kept telling me to drink red wine because it had iron in it and it would be good for the baby. And that was two decades ago in France. So cross-culturally, not just in Europe, but also in Asia, some drinking behavior and patterns in Korea and other places um, where they haven't looked at alcohol or consumption of alcohol during pregnancy the same way that we have. Um, and in the US, historically, very common in the 1940s and 50s, particularly for middle-class women, um, to be drinking routinely, to drink every day, to have a cocktail at five o'clock um, before or after her husband got home. Again, this also would have been during pregnancy because there were no warnings about uh, alcohol consumption during pregnancy until the 1970s when FAS was discovered. Um, so in our own modern history, we had women drinking routinely, drinking every day, including during pregnancy. And yet all of a sudden FAS appears as a concern that is being um, 
so culturally prolific that it is showing up on all the alcohol bottles. So as um, Claire had mentioned, the Surgeon General had issued a warning in 1981, so less than 10 years after we get the first articles about FAST. Um, and that warning um, said the Surgeon General advises women who are pregnant or considering pregnancy not to drink alcoholic beverages and to be aware of the alcoholic content of food and drugs, as well as actually drinking alcohol. And then in 1989, we got warning labels on our bottles of alcohol. And I just kind of, if we think about this from a content analysis perspective, if we look at the warning, so it actually starts with government warning, and then number one is, according to the Surgeon General, women should not drink alcoholic beverages during pregnancy because of the risk of birth defects. That's number one. It's the one that says Surgeon General in it. And then we move on to number two, which talks about alcoholic beverages impairing your ability to drive um, and operate machinery and may cause other health problems. So in the second part of the warning, we've incorporated two or three different things um, that all go together. They don't merit their own separate line. And it's number two. It becomes less important than women drinking during pregnancy. Even though if we look at statistics on uh, fatalities and injuries caused by people drinking, um, we might want to take issue with which would be the more important thing to address, which should actually be number one about my point about even when we do legitimately have a problem, um, is there a larger problem? Is there a problem affecting more people, making more people sick that maybe we should be paying more attention to? And yet this is the issue that we're um, putting our research dollars toward or our public messages about health toward. So I had long been interested in this topic, but I was uh, a little perplexed a couple of years ago when all of a sudden there was more public talk of this in part because the CDC had put out a new warning, a new recommendation to women not to drink alcohol if they're not using birth control, even if they're not trying to conceive. And um, there was some discussion of this and some critiques of this at the time. And within a couple of years of that CDC pronouncement, there was also a New York Times article stating that far more US children, this is the title, far more US children than previously thought may have fetal alcohol disorders that was based on um, an article in JAMA. And um, those two things together, I'm thinking why, why is this an issue again or newly sort of being talked about? And I got interested in it again and I started going back and looking both at the original JAMA article, but also at the various scientific articles, the research articles that led to the CDC's pronouncement in 2016, and trying to trace the history of what did they base this recommendation on, and then that article, what was that based on, and where was the research, and kind of actually traced back sort of two or three, you know, generations or iterations of articles to get to how did we get this CDC recommendation in 2016. Um, as I did that, one of the things that struck me is that in some of these research articles, there was some confounding of things that were measurable or things that uh, you know, were quantifiable health related with other things that were actually about morality or social behaviors. And so here's one example of that, where in an article by Tan et al from 2015, which is one of the articles that did in fact lead up to the new CDC warning, excessive alcohol use is defined as binge drinking, high weekly consumption, and then in italics, um, the italics are mine, any alcohol consumption by pregnant women or any alcohol consumption by those under the minimum legal drinking age of 21. So obviously a 19 or 20 year old having one beer at a party and not even driving afterwards, right? In a safe, responsible way, how is that excessive alcohol use? 
So we're confounding what's actually a law. Okay, they're breaking the law, it's underage drinking. But this is not a health issue to have one beer at a party and calling that excessive, interesting choice of language. So there that's breaking the law. Someone um, who's pregnant and drinking isn't breaking the law, but we're talking about social norms there. So we're sort of conflating different issues, health and social behaviors and, and uh, legality of behaviors. What had originally struck me and got me interested in this topic was that I had been reading Cynthia Daniels' book, Fetal Rights Versus Women's Rights, and came across a sentence in the middle of that book that um, cited this study, where as far back as 1987, we already had research pointing to what Claire was telling us about the difference in SES and rates of fast. And it's a huge difference. So Bingle et al. in 1987 found that when it was poor children, um, poor families with uh, alcoholic mothers, the rate of fast diagnosis was 71%, but only 4.5 for the children of wealthier alcoholic women. And that's a huge difference, obviously. And I kept thinking, you know, even if there's diagnosis error here, even if we're looking, say, at a different population, so maybe we have a white doctor who's looking at um, Native American indigenous children, babies, the, what are the facial features, maybe we have some misdiagnosis there, 10%, 20%. I, don't, I just didn't see how we could account for such a large difference. And more importantly, why did no one seem to be studying this? The Bingle et al. article, um, really elegant study, where they had a control group of poor women who didn't drink from a public hospital, and then the alcoholic mothers from that same hospital, and then the wealthier alcoholic women who had been in a, a treatment facility that cost a lot of money, retrospectively um, being asked questions about their children, doctor's reports, teacher's reports, and to have this much um, disparity in the outcome, they had a hypothesized things in 1987 like nutrition. They were concerned about what type of alcohol the women were drinking because it was the same amount, but it was different kinds. The poor women drank beer and rum, I believe, and the wealthier alcoholic moms were drinking scotch. Um, so they wanted to know, is it type of alcohol? It turns out it may be more likely to do with the pattern of drinking behavior where the poor moms were actually doing more binge drinking and the wealthier alcoholic moms were more likely to have a high blood alcohol level more consistently all the time. But there were hypotheses there about interaction effects with alcohol. And if the goal is public health and having healthier babies, why are we not studying interaction effects with nutrition or stress or patterns of binge drinking? Um, and just being struck by how long ago that article was published and how little research, there's some, um, Dr. Ernest Abel, who was mentioned before, has done some research on binge drinking, but very little. So I went back and I looked at all these studies um, leading to the CDC warning and uh, a lot of issues with expanding criteria, changing uh, rates, like how many standard deviations before we count something. Lots of the articles that led to the CDC warning simply said drinking during pregnancy, but the article they would be based on, the previous article, would make it clear that it was frequent drinking, heavy drinking, that would disappear in the next article that leads to the CDC report. Uh, lots of problems with operationalizing drinking, where we would actually have studies where it was seven drinks a week without knowing if that was seven drinks in a day or one glass of wine every night for dinner. If binge drinking is important, that really matters. And yet they would count within the same category of drinking. And then studies that made assumptions about drinking during pregnancy based on non-pregnant women's drinking patterns um, that are also very problematic. So looking at how we got here, uh, who funds the studies? And this is a real problem to get funding for research that maybe flies in the face of conventional wisdom. Um, 
also these issues of what I was talking about at the beginning, what, what resonates culturally? What are we concerned about? And one of the things we want to see with mothers is that mothers are going to be good mothers. They're not gonna be selfish. They're gonna put their children first. And how do you prove that? How do you show, including during pregnancy, that you're the right kind of mom? And you do that by making sacrifices. So if you don't drink while you're pregnant, you can pat yourself on the back, you're being a good mom. So women getting judged for their behavior and for being a good mom or a bad mom, this is much worse for women of color and also for low SES women. Um, for particular communities, the judging is worse. Um, Janet Golden is a historian who's written on this topic. She wrote a book called Message in a Bottle and shows the history of media coverage of white moms early on who didn't know what they were doing, wasn't their fault, felt bad, versus women of color at the bar, right in front of the warning at the bar, drinking because they don't care. Um, so conflating that. Also, culturally, we're still in a moment where we view fetuses and women as two separate things, that fetuses may have rights, they may be people. This, this grew out of wanting, understandably, to punish someone who pushes a pregnant woman down the stairs or a drunk driver who hits a family and kills the woman who's pregnant. Um, but at the same time, what this turned into when you create a separate person with different rights um, is that now you can start asking, what if the mother's doing something against the fetus? Should she be criminalized? Can we punish her for endangering or hurting her own fetus? Um, so seeing those two as separate entities. And then finally, blaming bad individuals for their poor choices rather than addressing social problems. Alcoholism is often tied to other substance abuse issues, to mental health issues, um, to living in an environment that might have other toxins like lead paint, um, when we get into class issues. And so when we're looking at a child who's impaired and the mother has several comorbidities and is living in a really poor toxic environment and is undergoing a lot of stress, how do we sort out um, what's coming from the alcohol what's coming from those other things and what are the interaction effects for those things. And ultimately, if we blame the individual, we don't have to do anything about it as a society. It's not our responsibility to clean up um, lead in the pipes or in the paint. It's not our responsibility to make sure she has a wage where she can support herself and maybe doesn't have to work in a factory where she's breathing something bad in while she's pregnant. Um, it becomes, she should have known better. If it's all about the alcohol, she can just stop drinking. So to conclude my section, I want us to consider how social conventions, norms, what's out there in the cultural environment influences the conclusions that researchers draw. And we like to think that public health recommendations are evidence-based, but as Claire just pointed out, if we were just straight up going with that, we might be telling all women to drink a little bit because their babies have better cognitive outcomes. And of course, it's not about the alcohol, it's probably about the class level of those women and other things. Are they choosing to be parents rather than becoming parents accidentally and other factors like that? Um, and then this issue of whether the desire to punish women who ignore these warnings is more about controlling women's non-normative behavior than it is about genuinely wanting to have healthier babies. Back to the Bingo et al. study from 1987. Why aren't we studying nutrition plus alcohol during pregnancy and how they interact? Um, there's also research that people who believe that pregnant women are doing negative things, if they think it hurts the baby, they're more likely to try to educate the women. If they don't actually believe that excessive exercise or alcohol hurts the baby, they're more likely though to want to punish the pregnant mom for doing those behaviors, which is a pretty odd finding, but it goes toward this morality, she's acting bad, she's not a good mother, therefore she deserves punishment. 
And I will end on this. I said cross-culturally, this has differed um, and that in different countries, they have been trying to do more research where they might be able to answer the question of, is there a safe amount of alcohol or not? And I just wanted to throw out one um, example from another country that does not look like our recommendation, different from our Surgeon General. And that's uh, Singapore that states if you have one or two drinks of alcohol, one or two units, once or twice a week, it is unlikely to harm your unborn baby. However, the amount of alcohol that is safe in pregnancy is not definitively known. Heavier frequent drinking can seriously harm the baby's development. Um, this starts a conversation, I think. This is um, a little more accurate in terms of admitting that there are things that we don't know. Um, and hopefully it would get women to have uh, conversations with others, including their medical care providers, and would also help to not shame women who have engaged in, in drinking during pregnancy, who would be more likely to talk about it uh, with a nurse, doctor, midwife, um, rather than trying to hide it because they're shamed for that type of behavior. So I think I'm out of time and I should turn it over to Chiara. I will stop there. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Killian. Um, before I introduce the final speaker, I just wanna remind everyone that you can submit your questions at any time using the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen. Um, we'll share these questions during the Q&A period towards the end of the event. And you can upvote questions submitted by other attendees if you like. So I'd now like to introduce our final speaker. Uh, Professor Chiara Bridges is the Professor of Law at UC Berkeley School of Law. She graduated valedictorian from Spurman College and received her JD from Columbia Law School and her PhD with distinction from Columbia University's Department of Anthropology. She was a member of the Columbia Law Review and a Kent Scholar. She's written many articles concerning race, class, reproductive rights, and the intersection of the three. She's also the author of several books and particularly relevant to today's seminar, this includes Reproducing Race and Ethnography of Pregnancy as a Site of Racialization. So today's discussion, discussion would not be complete without including her expertise. So thank you, Professor Bridges. Thank you so much. It's a joy to be here and to learn from the panelists, uh, my co-panelists, and I'm really looking forward to having a conversation after I give my remarks. So let me share my screen. Um, I'm going to sort of back up a little bit. And while um, the first two speakers um, focused on alcohol um, use during pregnancy, I want to think about um, other substances that have been the subject really of moral panics. And so my remarks today will be about opioid use during pregnancy. Um, and this, um, my remarks are based on an article that I published in the Harvard Law Review, and this is the title um, of the article. So um, just to sort of preview where I want to go today, um, the article ultimately is about the concept of white privilege, but I'll focus my remarks on some of the sort of data around opioid use during pregnancy, as well as comparing opioid use during pregnancy with crack cocaine use during pregnancy and the differing social responses we see um, to, to those different uh, drug crises. So this is what I will do today. First, I'll describe the data on opioid use during pregnancy, and then I'll discuss the laws response to substance use during pregnancy, first during the crack cocaine crisis of the 1980s, and then during the opioid epidemic of today. And then um, I won't spend too much time talking about what I think um, the criminalization of opioid use during pregnancy means for the concept of white privilege, um, but I will share at least one conclusion. So starting with the opioid epidemic, we all know that the opioid epidemic has been devastating and has led to an incredible loss of life in the US. Um, an important element of the opioid crisis is its whiteness. Um, the large majority of people using, misusing, dependent on, and dying from opioids during um, opioids period are white people. Um, of the close to 48,000 people who died from opioid overdoses in 2017, 78% were white, while 12% were black and 8% were Latinx. Now, observers say that these statistics explain um, why the government has been open to taking a less punitive approach to addressing the opioid crisis. Um, the argument is that the whiteness of the opioid crisis explains why people with the ability 
to direct law and policy have been receptive to understanding substance dependence as a medical condition that needs treatment as opposed to a moral failure that warrants punishment. Um, turning to opioid use and misuse during pregnancy more specifically, uh, while precise numbers are difficult to acquire, it appears that tens of thousands of pregnant people use opioids. And there is substantial agreement among healthcare providers about how to care for pregnant users of opioids as well as infants who have been exposed to opioids in utero. Notably, none of these courses of care involve criminal punishment. <laughs> Now, most healthcare pro uh, professionals propose that when opioid use has developed into an opioid use disorder, and when that opioid use disorder intersects with pregnancy, the best response is to ensure that the pregnant person receives prenatal care. Prenatal care and healthcare generally demonstrably improves pregnancy outcomes, even if the pregnant person continues to use opioids. Further, most providers agree, and actually let me pause and say, can you guys see my slides? <laughs> okay, good, I see Caitlin. <laughs> um, and so um, most providers agree that the best course of action is to use medication assisted treatment or MAT to stabilize a pregnant person with an opioid use disorder. MAT is the standard of care for treating opioid use disorder during pregnancy and MAT is preferred to complete abstention from opioids because complete withdrawal even when medically supervised has relapse rates between 59 and 90 percent. Additionally, complete withdrawal from opioids may cause the uterus to contract, which may result in miscarriage or premature delivery. Infants exposed to opioids in utero, including those born to people who have been maintained on methadone or another opioid substitute, they may develop neonatal abstinence syndrome or NAS. Symptoms of NAS, which typically develop within 24 to 72 hours after birth, include uncontrollable shaking and seizures, constant crying, vomiting and diarrhea, and a rapid respiratory rate. NAS symptoms can be reduced or eliminated entirely by simply allowing babies to breastfeed and have skin-to-skin -skin contact with their mothers. Indeed, researchers advise that properly swaddling a baby with NAS and placing it in a comfortable environment can alleviate the symptoms entirely. Nevertheless, at present, many hospitals tend to take infants with NAS away from their mothers and place them in neonatal um, intensive care units. Additionally, many hospitals give infants with severe NAS symptoms an opioid like methadone or morphine to try to help alleviate the symptoms. Now, this is a course of treatment that many experts believe to be unnecessary because a host of studies show that rooming in, just keeping the baby with the mother, can better achieve the same goal of comforting the baby and alleviating the symptoms. While some research reports um, that babies with NAS are at risk for negative health outcomes, most studies have concluded that NAS is transitory, it is treatable, and it has no lasting adverse consequence. The first study on the long-term effects of NAS is still under underway. So as it turns out, pregnancy may represent an exception to the overall national willingness to treat the opioid epidemic as an issue of public health and not as an issue of law enforcement. I love this quote from a journalist, Melissa Jelt. She writes, there's a growing consensus in the U.S. that drug addiction is a public health issue and sufferers need treatment, not prison time, but good luck if you are pregnant. So how has the law addressed substance use during pregnancy? Um, the state's approach to substance use during pregnancy might be schematized into those efforts that involve civil systems and those that involve criminal systems. States that choose to deal with substance use during pregnancy with civil systems call upon their existing child protection agencies. And these agencies are asked to assess parental fitness and when deemed appropriate to remove infants from their birth parents and place them in homes that the child welfare authorities believe to be more suitable. Advocates for addressing substance use during pregnancy through state child welfare bureaucracies invariably defend the approach as one that protects the health and safety of infants. However, opponents of this approach wholeheartedly reject that claim. 
They insist that child protection bureaucracy's impulse to separate babies from their birth parents is brutal, it's inhumane, and it does more harm than good. With respect to addressing substance use during pregnancy with criminal systems, um, every medical and public health organization of record that has spoken on the issue of pregnant women and substance use um, have opposed arresting and prosecuting pregnant people with a substance use disorder. Nevertheless, despite the near unanimous opinion of experts in the health sciences, arrests and prosecutions of women for substance use during pregnancy occur with disturbing frequency. The most repeated justification for criminalizing substance use during pregnancy is that the criminal legal system is an effective mechanism for convincing a pregnant person with a substance use disorder to get treatment. The idea is that if the state has the ability to prosecute a pregnant person with a substance use disorder, it can then offer her a choice, criminal charges or drug treatment. The expectation is that when faced with such a choice, a pregnant person with a drug dependence will choose treatment, which increases the ch chances that she will stop using her substance of choice and ultimately give birth to an infant unaffected by the substance. Proponents of criminalization who justify the approach in this way assume that there are treatment options readily available to pregnant people struggling with substance use disorders. But this is not an accurate assumption, especially in the context of the opioid crisis. Due to a combination of reasons that I don't have time to get into, um, 81 to 95 percent of need is unmet. And it bears underscoring that proponents of criminalization often justify criminalizing substance use during pregnancy with the claim that threatening a pregnant person with a criminal conviction and jail time effectively protects her health and the health of the fetus that she carries. However, healthcare providers and researchers assert that criminal laws have not had the effect of improving maternal and infant health outcomes. Instead, addressing substance use disorder during pregnancy with criminal law worsens maternal and infant health outcomes. Studies have shown that criminal penalties scare pregnant people with substance use disorders away from prenatal care altogether. This is because they have a reasonable fear that their healthcare providers will turn them over to the police upon discovery of their drug use. Indeed, this is precisely what has happened to many people in states that have criminalized drug use during pregnancy. Their doctors, have turned them over to the police. Despite the reality that criminalizing substance use during pregnancy has not had the effect of getting pregnant people with disorders um, into treatment, and despite the negative effects that this approach has had on maternal and infant health, states have insisted upon prosecuting pregnant people for exposing their fetuses to controlled substances. At present, Tennessee is the only state that has passed uh, a law specifically criminalizing substance use during pregnancy. Unfortunately, the state allowed the law to expire in 2016 after a host of organizations and experts rallied to produce that very result. In the other states where prosecutions have taken place, which is practically every state in the country, Prosecutors have relied on existing criminal laws. And so states have prosecuted people who have used uh, drugs during their pregnancies for a range of crimes, including criminal child abuse and neglect, delivering drugs to a minor, criminal endangerment, and assault with a deadly weapon. So turning to the demographics of those arrested and prosecuted for substance use during pregnancy, when it comes to socioeconomic status, the class demographics of those facing arrest and prosecution for substance use during pregnancy are unsurprising. Um, given that those swept up within the US's robust criminal legal system are overwhelmingly poor, it should be no surprise that those who have faced criminal prosecution for substance use during pregnancy typically are poor as well. Of the women who were arrested under Tennessee's fetal assault law, nearly all of them qualified for indigent defense. And of the women prosecuted for substance use during pregnancy in Alabama from 2006 to 2015, 89% of them relied on a public defender. So people are poor. Now, it's important to note that the relative scarcity of prosecutions of more affluent people for substance use during pregnancy is not because poor people are the only ones using substances during pregnancy. Substance use independence exists across the socioeconomic ladder. 
Professor Michelle Goodwin notes that studies suggest that white women and women with higher levels of education are more likely to seek and acquire prescription medications, including Xanax, Oxycontin, Demerol, and Tylenol with codeine during their pregnancy. Now, while the drugs in these prescription medications may have the same effects on fetuses as drugs that are not prescribed or can be purchased in the street, white women with some degree of class privilege are rarely, if ever, prosecuted for substance use during pregnancy. As Goodwin summarizes, although educated white women are more likely to take prescription medications during pregnancy generally and use more prescription medications during pregnancy at the age, prosecutors nevertheless ignore that cohort of gestating mothers. Instead, they choose to target poor women. Now, turning to the race of those arrested and prosecuted for substance use during pregnancy, prosecutions for substance use during pregnancy began in earnest during the crack cocaine scare in the 1980s. And this was a scare that, of course, was racialized as Black. Um, during this time, politicians, policymakers, and media outlets portrayed the infants who were exposed to crack cocaine in utero as hopelessly damaged. They depict these children as the country's eventual juvenile delinquents, criminals, welfare queens, and budget dreams. Um, Charles Krauthammer, um, I have excerpt of or a little image of his um, article. He wrote um, an article called um, Worse Than Brave New World, Newborns Permanently Damaged by Cocaine. And this article reflects the tone of the stories that were written about what the media and politicians called crack babies. So Krauthammer, who was actually and is still a Pulitzer Prize winning journalist, he warned readers that, quote, the newest horror was being born in American inner cities. And this horror was, quote, a bio underclass, a generation of physically damaged cocaine babies whose biological infer inferiority is stamped at birth, end quote. He claimed that this horror lurked in poor black neighborhoods. Essentially, babies exposed to crack cocaine in utero were represented as the future problems of America. Further, the women who smoked crack cocaine while pregnant were portrayed as heartless, irresponsible, and selfish. The negative portrayal of these women in mainstream media perhaps made it easy to want to punish them for using crack while pregnant, for ruining their fetuses, and for burdening society with their costly babies. And that is precisely what prosecutors did during the crack cocaine scare of the 1980s. They tried to punish these women, prosecuting them for child maltreatment, assault, homicide, and an array of other crimes. Black women were largely those facing criminal prosecution for substance use during pregnancy at this time. As Julie Ehrlich Wright describes it, the war on drugs became a war on women of color, with prosecutions of pregnant women focusing on those women who use crack cocaine, a drug predominantly found in low income communities of color. It bears noting that if the justification for prosecuting Black women struggling with a cocaine dependence was that the women deserve punishment for harming their fetuses through their substance use, then the prosecutions were unjustified. While many of the babies born to women who struggled with cocaine dependence were small or sick, there is very little evidence to suggest that their exposure to cocaine alone caused these poor health outcomes. That is, the evidence cannot support the claim that all other things being equal, these babies would have been born completely healthy had their mothers abstained from using crack cocaine during their pregnancies. Instead, the evidence establishes that poverty and unhealthy neighborhoods much more likely caused these babies poor health outcomes. The longitudinal studies that have been conducted on children who have been ex exposed to cocaine in utero show that they do not differ from children who did not sustain in utero exposure to cocaine. These studies establish that while cocaine may have had a nominal effect on children exposed to it in utero, poverty by far bears the greatest responsibility for infant morbidity and mortality. As neonatologist Halem Hurt puts it, Poverty is a more powerful influence on the outcome of inner city children than gestational exposure to cocaine. Nevertheless, during the crack cocaine scare, the impoverished, unhealthy environments in which poor black women lived were erased from view. And with this context completely obscured, 
women's use of crack cocaine was identified as the sole cause of their infant's poor health. It's important to note that even if cocaine use during pregnancy could cause permanent or significant harm to fetuses, and even if poor Black women did in fact harm their fetuses by using cocaine while pregnant, there remains the question of why the state chose to single out women who use that particular substance while pregnant. A number of other substances can harm fetuses. Why punish the individuals who expose their fetuses to one specific harmful substance when many substances, some illegal, some legal, also cause harm? For example, cigarette smoke is exceedingly harmful to fetuses. Studies show that smoking cigarettes during pregnancy causes fetal growth restriction, preterm delivery, placenta previa, placental abruption, some congenital abnormalities and impaired lung development. Yet during the crack cocaine scare of the 1980s, prosecutors did not bring criminal charges against the hundreds of thousands of women who smoked cigarettes while pregnant and exposed their fetuses to known harm. Instead, prosecutors brought charges only against the women who used one highly stigmatized drug that was imagined to harm fetuses, crack cocaine. And scholars have argued that the state's choice to single out users of crack cocaine for criminal punishment while ignoring users of the abundance of other substances that are unhealthy to fetuses, that choice to single out users of crack cocaine for criminal punishment is a consequence of crack cocaine having been racialized as Black. Now, historically speaking, prosecutions for substance use during pregnancy have tended to fall on the shoulders of Black women. However, there has been a shift because the opioid epidemic has significantly affected white people, a substantial number of white women have found themselves pregnant while struggling with opioid use disorder. And the consequence is that white women now predominate among those who have been arrested and prosecuted for substance use during pregnancy. So my paper ultimately is, a, a, is ultimately about what this shift in the racial demographics of prosecutions for substance use during pregnancy means for the concept of white privilege. And I actually come up with four lessons in the paper, but I'll just tell you about one of them now. And then one, the white privilege can be attenuated by non-white disadvantage. So let me explain. In the 1980s, the nation was confronted with a frightening drug scare and the possibility that infants were being irreparably harmed by a substance that was decimating communities. Society chose to address this phenomenon with the criminal system and the criminal law. And moreover, society chose this path and rejected less punitive alternatives in part because the phenomenon was racialized as Black. More than three decades later, the nation faces an equally frightening drug scare and the possibility that infants are being irreparably harmed by a substance that is decimating communities. The thing is, we have a racist precedent for dealing with this very situation. This racist precedent constrains the ability of society to imagine and implement different mechanisms for addressing this phenomenon. As a nation, we might have path dependence. The racist path that was generated in the 1980s has led us to be punitive towards a population that due to its racial privilege might have escaped our nation's punitive inclinations which is to say in the 1980s, when faced with the fact of pregnant people who used and were dependent on substances, we chose the path of prosecution. And we made this choice in part because so many of the women were black. Throwing these people in jail was politically acceptable and desirable because they were black. Now in the early decades of the 21st century, we have a racist model to guide us in managing the social problem of pregnant people who use and are dependent on substances. White women facing criminal charges for opioid use during pregnancy may just be reaping the bitter seeds of the racism that the government directed towards and designed for people of color. And that is all that I have. Thank you so much. I'm going to stop sharing my screen and we can get to this conversation. Thank you so much, Professor Bridges. This is a really important part of the conversation. Um, there are a couple of questions coming in in the Q&A and please um, keep sharing those and we'll get to them um, for the audience. So maybe I will start with a question um, and also maybe each of you have uh, questions for, for me or each other. Um, Kiara, you um, highlighted that 
um, in criminalizing substance use during pregnancy rather than possession um, is actually an expansion of the law because it's not against the law to be in most places to use drugs. Um, and so in that way, it creates a specifically gender based crime where being a woman and being pregnant is a condition of this crime. So I'm wondering by the same token, have there been cases or, or could something that is actually legal like drinking alcohol or smoking cigarettes ever be used to incriminate a woman just because she's pregnant or um, any other negative consequences? Absolutely, yes. Yeah. So um, part of, so there's a problem with um, criminalizing or using punitive legal systems to respond to in, you know, substance use during pregnancy just as a, as a, as a general matter, right? It's inhumane, it's brutal, it's dignity denying, it's bad for health, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but there's also a danger that when we start criminalizing um, substance use during opioid use during pre pregnancy, cocaine use during pregnancy, it opens the door for the state to use criminal punishment and, and, and punitive civil systems to um, address perfectly legal behavior that may harm um, fetuses. And so the danger and the risk has always been um, that we can now um, punish pregnant people who exercise too much during pregnancy. Exercising too much is not, you know, it's certainly not um, illegal, but if exercising too much actually poses some sort of risk of harm for the fetus, then a state that is engaged in rabid fetal protectionism may be able to sweep that up within its sort of criminal prescription and its punitive civil systems. And, you know, eating sushi during pregnancy, right? Eating sushi is perfectly legal. Um, but when, but when that uh, behavior intersects with pregnancy, it may pose a risk of harm to fetuses. Um, that becomes something that um, can be swept up within the purview of criminal systems and civil systems. So the idea here and the, the lesson here is that we all are in danger. Everybody with the capacity for pregnancy, women, trans men, non-binary people, all people with the capacity for pregnancy um, are at risk here of being, um, um, we're all made vulnerable by a state that is engaged in rabid fetal protectionism. Because I, I want to underscore this and then I'll stop talking. Rabid fetal protectionism is only made possible by the denigration of the people who are gestating fetuses. <laughs> And uh, that's a, it sounds like kind of an impossible question for either courts or child protective services to try to determine um, causality that, you know, in order to determine whether a mother's substance use during pregnancy constitutes child abuse and neglect being the basis of the, those consequences. It really seems like an impossible challenge given how difficult it is for scientists to causality in humans. Um, whose mothers drink drugs. So how can states or any type of authority be confident that any adverse effects are caused by drug use given that science is so unsure and effects are so wide ranging? Right, exactly, well, that's the, that's the problem. And that is the, um, the principle that has run roughshod um, in these prosecutions, the principle that you have to establish causation between um, a behavior and an outcome. Um, so um, there's a one of the first prosecutions for murder um, that occurred um, for uh, cocaine use during pregnancy was a woman named Regina McKnight, and she was dependent on a crack cocaine, um, and she suffered a stillbirth. And she was uh, ultimately sentenced to 20 years in jail. And her uh, conviction was ultimately overturned, but only after she had spent a decade um, behind bars. And her conviction was overturned because the judge finally listened to science and there was no way to establish that her crack cocaine use led to the stillbirth. In fact, the only reason why her conviction was overturned because there is evidence that she had an, an untreated infection that likely caused the stillbirth. But even without the untreated infect infection, right there's just no evidence that uh, cocaine use again all other things being equal cocaine use or opioid use or methadone use or methamphetamine use that that is actually what leads to the poor health outcomes much more likely and caitlin mentioned this already 
poverty is violence. <laughs> and a lot of people who are struggling with cocaine dependence and method, um, um, methamphetamine dependence and opioid dependence, they're impoverished, right? And so it's the poverty that is likely harming the fetus and the pregnant person and not independent in, in the substance use is not the independent cause of the poor health outcomes that um, these people and their fetuses suffer. I just wanted to to add to that to reiterate that in some of these cases there was no harm to the infant. There there's nothing medically wrong with the infant. There's nothing, and still, babies have been taken away and mothers have been prosecuted even without a stillbirth or a severely underweight baby or some kind of marker of something being being wrong with the the child. And then I also. Um, wanted to go back to that study I was talking about since Kiara had mentioned <laughs> over exercising. That was one of the variables that they used in that study. Um, and there was a third, I forget what the third one was, if it was smoking or so it was alcohol use during pregnancy, it was um, exercise and maybe smoking was the third. And people who thought that that didn't hurt the baby, but thought that it was wrong, wanted to wanted more punishments than people who actually thought that those behaviors would hurt the fetus. So that that's pretty telling right there about how we're legislating morality um, and people's orientations to this um, when there's no actual harm or maybe even no belief that there would be harm and yet we wanna criminalize these behaviors. Hmm. Um. I want to look at some of the questions from the Q&A now. Um, and one is asking um, how you communicate with our colleagues that repeat the advice, no amount of alcohol in pregnancy has been proven safe. So that the recommendation is no alcohol in pregnancy. I find this fear-based argument difficult to engage with productively. Um, I wonder this myself a lot, and I actually would like to add to this question. I want to share this video um, that I saw recently. So that's a pretty typical example of the, um, one of these kinds of campaigns. Um, clearly the, uh, you know, the goal is to explicitly elicit feelings of guilt and shame among pregnant women with the theory being that fear and a desire to avoid negative consequences is a good motivator for changing behavior. Um, in this case, quitting alcohol. So my question is um, maybe to Professor Killian, um, does this actually work? And perhaps more seriously, what are the potential unintended consequences of these messages? And then the, the, the um, attendees question also is about how we communicate with colleagues uh, that repeat this advice. So I, I think part of the unintended consequences that I, that I think are important to consider are how this affects all women and certainly all pregnant people. But these messages about even if you're considering pregnancy or even if you're not trying to get pregnant, now you shouldn't drink uh, if you're not on birth control. And that there's this larger social control of women's behavior behind that, um, that we're falling into and that we're reproducing, where women, um, their behavior is policed literally, um, as Kiara was telling us about, but also by, by being shamed by the looks that you get from a, another restaurant patron if you order a glass of wine while pregnant. Um, and I talked to my students about this. We read the book by sociologist Elizabeth Armstrong, Conceiving Risk, Bearing Responsibility, Fetal Alcohol Syndrome and the Diagnosis of Moral Disorder. And we read the whole book and they say, okay, I'm, I'm kind of convinced this isn't as bad as I was taught, but would I drink while pregnant? I don't know. It just like, it feels wrong or what would people think of me? Um, so there's that whole element. In terms of communicating with, with colleagues um, and researchers, I think it's very hard. It's, very, it's hard to get funding for research. And I, I hope in a few minutes we take the question about men and connections to reproduction. That's also very hard to get funding for. 
Um, but so it's hard to get funding for, and a lot of people just dismiss it out of hand. And it kind of becomes this, all we're saying is don't drink. Like, is that such a big sacrifice, right? And that's why I think we have to put it in this context of we're supposed to be giving recommendations that are evidence-based. So where's the evidence? And then what, what is the harm, right? Back to my point of like taking away Halloween, <laughs> it was a digression, but there's a point there. There is harm in teaching people to not trust their neighbors. And there is harm in teaching people that women can't be trusted and that women have to be told what to do in terms of their own bodies and their own decisions during pregnancy. And that is serious and that is worth considering. I just, I just want to add to that very point. And there's a harm in constructing a antagonistic relationship between fetus and, and, and gestating person, right? So when the gestating person is not imagined to know what's best for the fetus and to and will do what's best for the fetus, that means that outside actors have to assume that role. And so here comes the state, here comes, you know, social, you know, stigma um, to protect the fetus because the, the gestating person is not doing that protection. And um, there was a question in the Q&A about how does this relate to abortion and uh, you know, the fight over the constitutionality and legality of abortion. And um, so um, I, I can't speak about fetal alcohol uh, syndrome, but I can speak about crack cocaine use during pregnancy. I can use, speak about opioid use during pregnancy. Um, it is impossible to disentangle um, this, this a rabbit fetal protectionism from the fight over the constitutionality of abortion in the US. Um, and it's because um, uh, the state has assumed or has imagined that it needs to assume this role as protector of the fetus, because if it doesn't, well, then doctors will kill the baby and mothers will kill their babies. And so now the state has taken up this mantle of protector of the fetus. And again, that's only made possible by possible by a denigration of the bodies of the people who are actually gestating the fetus, um, but it's also made possible by imagining that the fetus and the person who gestates the fetus are in an antagonistic relationship. Mm. Um, let's take this question, why not study men's pattern of drinking while trying to conceive? Um, Professor Killian, do you want to add more to that? I do very much. Um, Men are in a position where it's kind of a double-edged sword. On one hand, their behaviors and bodies are not policed. On the other hand, their reproductive health is largely ignored and misunderstood. So there is evidence about things like smoking and drinking and outcomes on pregnancy and miscarriage and um, offspring's health. There's some evidence in rats smoking for two generations back may have an impact like so a, a grandfather rat right on grandbaby rats from smoking and low birth weights and things like that um, so there is some evidence i would recommend an excellent book by cynthia daniels called exposing men the science and politics of um, male reproduction i think where she traces the history um, and one of the sections talks about how people even even if they got results had trouble getting research funding um, couldn't get grants couldn't get people to support research into men and yet we know there's effects of age and age and sperm um, environmental toxins things that work men in certain professions their wives are more likely to have miscarriages and um, wives and female partners who are seeking pregnancy are more likely to have miscarriages and yet um, you know we don't want to tell dentists and anesthesiologists that they can't work while they're trying to conceive a baby um, well we have told women they have to get sterilized to continue working with um, lead in a factory or certain paint products in a factory. Um, so on one hand, men escape some of this, but on the downside of that is that their health is ignored and we see women visibly pregnant. So we make the association that reproduction is about women and women's bodies. And we forget that men's health um, and you know toxins and things they're exposed to can attach to sperm can cause miscarriage and we definitely need to study that more but it would take some understanding that that reproduction is just is not just about women and female bodies or female um, presenting bodies 
and a, um, a practical challenge in studying this in terms of epidemiology is there is assortative mating where women who drink alcohol tend to have partners who also drink alcohol. It's actually very hard to study this in, in humans, but some of the large um, cohort studies have been able to um, use uh, partner drinking or fathers drinking as like a control group where you have environmental and social effects without the actual alcohol exposure in utero. And what you can see when, when samples are big enough to allow that comparison is that there's, there's uh, often no difference in effects on um, between mothers drinking on infant outcomes uh, compared with fathers drinking on infant outcomes. So it hasn't been looked at nearly enough, but um, actually practically quite hard to even, uh, even address. I uh, think we are nearly out of time. Pamela, do you want to conclude? Um, well, first of all, I want to thank all of the speakers for this really important um, and incredibly powerful um, presentations on this important issue. Really, really impressive. I do want to just give you all a chance to respond to one of the, or there were actually a couple of questions in the um, Q&A about how we might go about shifting the political and social discourse um, to a more evidence-based scientific um, discourse. Now, these are this is of course a huge question, but one of the um, one of the questioners asked whether there are agencies working on drug policy. Um, you know, are there are there efforts in law, in the legal air, in legal field, or in other areas that um, we might get some um, ch real change in this regard? Any um, comments? I, I'll just, I'll, I mean, I have so much to say about that. Um, but so I'll try to be brief. Um, I guess you know, and when I think about shifting the social discourse, I would ask um, people to. Um, be consistent. So if you really care about fetuses, you wouldn't just care about substance use or alcohol use during pregnancy. You would also care about air quality, the type of water that people have access to, the pesticides that they're exposed to in the course of um, their work, um, whether they're exposed to chemicals um, and, and just by walking down the street, right? Uh, you would care about so many things that, that have not that precede rather substance use during pregnancy. And the second thing that I'll say is there are a host of organizations um, that are that are struggling specifically in the child welfare slash family regulation context um, to stop the punitive approach that ACS and Child Protective Services um, takes towards substance use during pregnancy. And so that is more supportive and less punitive. Um, in New York City, there's Bronx Defenders. Um, Marty Guggenheim at NYU has been in this in, in this space for um, decades, I would say. So there are organizations. Um, and if you would like to sort of to join in this fight, email me and I'll point you in the right direction. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, Caitlin, Claire, you want to respond? I really just want to say we, we need to keep getting that message out that criminalization um, penalties, they impair health. They do the opposite. So it is hypocritical to pass this legislation saying we're going to protect infants or mothers and infants because all it does is drive women away um, from birthing in a hospital. And some of those women are the women who most should be where there might be intensive care or certain facilities. Um, and it encourages women to lie and to hide behaviors. And so if we can treat this differently, then people can be more honest with their healthcare providers. Um, but, but we all have a, a piece to play in that in terms of how we judge other people and their behaviors while pregnant. Um, and I would just add that increasing guilt and fear and shame in people who struggle with substance use actually will may have the exact opposite effect to what you intend and make them more likely to continue using those substances and much less likely to have a real conversation with their medical provider about that. So I guess I would just reiterate that anything that is aimed at supporting a pregnant woman's mental health may reduce her substance use and it, whether or not that, that woman drinks or uses drugs, we know that that 
is a really uh, has really positive effects on her uh, child development as well. Well, thank you all so much. I want to thank our speakers for joining us today. I want to thank um, you, the audience, for your really thoughtful comments and questions. Um, I want to invite you to visit our website to register or sign up for our mailing list. And also, if you want to share um, the video of this event um, with others um, so that you can get the word out further, it will be available on our website. So please do go there. Um, thank you all for your really, really important and powerful um, uh, discussions today. Thanks very much. Thank you.